Mr. Hyden, Papa Hyden, as he's affectionately known, and was known as that during his lifetime, um, comes from the country of Austria, which at the time was a huge Austrian Hungarian empire, which we will talk about a little bit before we actually start to explore Haydn himself, so that we get some sort of idea of the context of the 18th century that he lived in. So let's go to the first slide. So you see in front of you, rather than looking at me, you can look at pictures and videos and various things during this little session. So you will see the map of Europe, if you're familiar with that, looks very, very different than it does today. Uh, you see a, a sort of orangey color Hungary and then lots of small little states next to it, which is Austria, Moravia, Bohemia and many others as well. This made up what was known in those days as the Austri Austrian Hungarian Empire. And it was run by a family called the Habsburgs. Um, they had been on the throne of Austria-Hungary and indeed Spain since the 13th century. And in fact, the, the emperors of Austria-Hungary were to stay there until 1918 at the end of the First World War. So that's a very, very long time that one family was ruling uh, the country. Um, during the period of the 18th century, uh, when Haydn was living, there were all sorts of things going on. Um, there were w lots of wars. There were two wars in his lifetime, in his early part of his lifetime, which was the War of the Austrian Succession, um, followed by the Seven Years' War, which were really sort of quite nasty affairs, including a lot of European countries. And yet Haydn's music doesn't really sort of show us any of that, but he would have been living, you know, at difficult, difficult times um, often during his life. I mean, you can see there, for instance, the po Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a massive country that doesn't exist anymore. So that just gives you an idea of the background. Um, the picture you saw when we came on at the beginning was of us standing in the square in Eisenstadt, which is very near Vienna. So this is the Empress Maria Theresa, a very, very prominent uh, ruler of Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 18th century. Um, Haydn would have met her and played at the court as indeed did Mozart. And so if we move on to the next slide, she was succeeded by her son, Joseph II, a great uh, follower and patron of the arts. Again, very much making Austria and Vienna particularly the centre, as it was then, of cultural life in Europe. Next. And during this period, um, the Age of Enlightenment, as it was known, progress through reason was this great thought process of philosophers, writers, musicians, you know, you, you name it, artists, and they all got together for this huge cultural movement which started early in the 18th century and died with the coming of the French Revolution in 1789. But as you can see at the court of Maria Theresa there, this wonderful picture of everybody getting together and, and capturing this fantastic painting. So this just gives us an idea of what was going on while Haydn was working, playing, composing, and generally living his life in the 18th century. So we move on. So to Haydn. So this is a picture of his birthplace. Um, it was in a, a little town called Rural, which is very, very near the modern day Hungarian border. So well within, as I described earlier, the Austro-Hungarian empire. His father, Matthias, was a, a wheelwright, which is somebody that used to make the wheels for the horses and carts and the coaches and carriages. And instead of going to the garage to get your puncture fixed, you would have gone to the wheelwright to get your wheels fixed on your cart or your carriage or whatever, or your coach. His mother was um, a cook. Her name was Maria. She was a cook. And it's believed that neither of them read music, although Haydn's father, Matthias, apparently was into singing of folk music. And they recognized at a very, very early age that young Joseph Haydn, who'd been born in 1732, 
had considerable talent in music. He was sent to study uh, with one of his relatives in the, at a local school where his apparently was beaten quite savagely, which uh, wouldn't have been terribly pleasing, uh, where he learned both the violin and the harpsichord and progressed very quickly. He was then discovered by George von Ruka and taken to Vienna, where he joined St. Stephen's Cathedral Choir and spent those formative years singing in the Cathedral Choir. When his voice finally broke, uh, the Empress, Maria Theresa, whose picture we saw earlier, apparently was absolutely furious and said he sounded like a cow when he was singing. And so he, she suggested he be expelled from the choir, which uh, he, he left fairly shortly after that. Um, after a sort of period of, of basically trying to freelance, which quite tough in those days, as it is today often for a lot of musicians, he was discovered um, by uh, Nicholas Esterhazy, who was a, a count, a lord. Let's, let's move on to the next picture. Um, that's a picture, of, by the way, of C.P. Bach, Bach. Um, who uh, Haydn studied with and was a great admirer of his music. Uh, but C.P. Bach was the son of the famous J.S. Bach and was beginning to change the way people wrote music uh, up until that point. The, the Baroque style of music written by composers like Handel and Bach was changing. And although Haydn is often thought of as the father of the modern symphony, I think the roots of it came from C.P. Bach, of whom Haydn studied his works diligently. So let's move on. So this is Prince Nic Nicholas Esterhazy, patron of the arts, uh, a prince, owner of palaces all over Europe. And Haydn went to work for him as vice Kapellmeister. Now you may ask, what is a Kapellmeister? The music of the court. So he looked after the choirs, the orchestras. He wrote music for the prince. He, he conducted the orchestras and generally ran the music in the household, which for Prince Nicholas was a huge thing because he was an absolute adamant fan of, of music. So there's that rather distinguished looking of Prince Nicholas Esterhazy. So Haydn went there in 1761 uh, and went to a place called Eisenstadt. Let's move on. Um, we're going to see a little picture, a little video of Eisenstadt now. Um, so you get an idea of what the town looked like. And this is video is of today, and it would look pretty much the same in Haydn's time. I was very, very fortunate to go twice and play in this palace as a member of the Australian String Quartet. Um, and it was really wonderful to be playing in places where Haydn had written and played this wonderful music. So let's have a little look at this video, uh, a bit of a guided tour of the town of Eisenstadt, just outside Vienna. <laughs>
that that's the end of that little clip. Um, so that was a very interesting tour around Eisenstadt. So that's pretty much what Haydn would have seen in his time. So what we're going to do now on the next video, we're going to go inside the palace. We're going to have a look at the concert hall where I had the great pleasure to play Haydn quartets. And then we're going to take a little look at some of the instruments that Haydn was interested in at the time. Now, there was an instrument called the baritone, which was a multi-string string instrument. And this was played by the prince himself. So Haydn wrote many, many pieces for this instrument. And you'll see it any second now. And it basically, after the 18th century, it completely died in importance. And although, although one or two people do play it today, it's hardly played. But Haydn is said to have written over 200 pieces for this instrument called the baritone. So let's have a look at the next video. Just over a year. The son of a rural wheelwright, Haydn had trained as a choir boy at St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. In his 20s, he'd gone into service with the Esterhazy family in the small town of Eisenstadt, 30 miles southeast of Vienna. The magnificent Esterhazy Palace was to prove the perfect laboratory for the young composer's extraordinary talents. So, Father, am I imagining Haydn walking to work along this corridor every day? He did, yeah. He wasn't living in a palace, but this was his workshop. So to be there twice a day, speaking with the prince, to get the wishes from him, what kind of music he, he wants to hear or what he has to prepare. Yeah. And yeah, and then he, he, he rehearsed here with the musicians. He's rehearsing in this room. In this room and maybe rooms next to this. Right. To this, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is some adventure playground. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I always say this is Haydn's great land. Yeah. <laughs> and you so can hear oh, the most beautiful acoustic. It wasn't like this, the acoustic, because uh, the wood wasn't here. Okay. Mm. When he came in here, so he found this place, yeah? Wonderful hall, big hall. With a marble floor, though. With the marble floor, and this is not so good for acoustic conditions. So he asked the prince to put logs, wood on it, so that it's better for the end. And now we find even the bills of the carpenters who did this in 1761. So Haydn asked for conditions to have the perfect, the perfect situation. Like I said, it was a workshop for him. So you said, wow, when you came in here, yeah? So maybe Haydn did this well, and he had to compose symphonies for the, for the prince. There were no symphonies before. So Haydn came here and this, and this thing was, uh, number six, seven, and eight now, symphony. The, Matin, midi, soir. Morning, uh, lunchtime, and, and, and evening, and look up on the ceiling. That's what it is. We have Laurora, the goddess of, of sunrise, on, on the carriage, and yeah, we have here La Luna. And it's the evening, yeah? <laughs> the evening goddess. In the middle, this marriage on the Olympus, but it's noon. God, that is incredible. So there you have that wonderful hall in the Palace of Eisenstadt. And as Dr. Riker said on that thing, he actually changed the floor to keep it wooden because if it, it remained marble, the sound would have been like playing in a bathroom. And incidentally, Dr. Riker is also, he's the, uh, the, the head of the great Haydn Festival. And it was him that invited me twice to visit the festival. So it was great finding that bit of footage of him talking. And so the next bit we look at is to look, look at this, um, these instruments and, and as, well, as well as the instrument I described, we will also take a look at Haydn's piano. Because if you think about it, instruments in those days were quite different than they are now. Our stringed instruments, for a start with the, the strings all played with gut strings, those were a different shape. You couldn't sustain the sound so much. And wind instruments looked and sounded quite different. So let's have a look at this um, baritone and Haydn's piano in this le next little excerpt. Nicholas of Esterhazy could trust Haydn to keep him at the cutting edge of symphonic invention. But he also had a rather touching passion for an unusual and archaic instrument. 
What is this wonderful instrument? Well, it's called a baritone. It has six or sometimes seven strings like this one. And they're tuned a little bit like a guitar or a lute. It's not easy to play. I mean, okay, if you play viol, that's one thing, but, but um, this thing. This is a whole other set of strings behind the set of strings you were showing us. Yes. And that can create problems. I mean, you, you have to work on that. So you're playing with the thumb of your left hand yes. on the strings at the back. I plug them. It's all about multitasking. That's it. And that's the problem about it. So you can accompany yourself in the worst case. For example, like this. And that's what makes the sound special, but what makes it a little hard to play. So there's not too many people trying to do that. <laughs> Prince not played the baritone, do you think Haydn would have written nearly so much music for the instrument? I'm sure he wouldn't have written anything. Because even in those times it was a very special instrument. After just a few years at Esterhazy, Prince Nicholas rewarded him with the post of head of music. And Haydn was able to buy his first house just down the road from the palace. This is house where I left. And he work from here, and this little thing here. <laughs> is that his piano? Yeah, his forte piano. Anton Walter built this from Vienna. It was very famous at this time. I always say, please don't touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I the thing is, I'm with you. But yeah. I think we can we can manage this. So Fantastic. Maybe you try. <laughs> Have a try. Well. <laughs> Beautiful, delicate little sound, just as you'd expect. They're such little perfect instruments, these Viennese forte pianos. This is a Valta, and I think I'm right in saying Mozart had a Valta as well. Yeah, in his birthplace in Salzburg, they have a forte piano. They thought it's an Anton Valta. And when this was restored, they found out it's from the same piece of wood. No. <laughs> so they brought us. <laughs> That is ridiculous. And Haydn and Mozart are friends. These so. two great masters, yes. Haydn and Mozart, both own forty pianos, which are drawn from the same tree. That is quite remarkable. A good coincidence, I think. Look at this picture, yeah? So now, that is the famous image of Haydn, isn't it? He's a younger man, yeah. 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 He's on his forty piano composing. He's got a very kind face. Do you agree with that? He himself said, I'm not a, a handsome man. But a uh, woman loved me anyway. <laughs> but he um, was good humored. And I'm sure you could see this in his face that he loved to talk with people, that he was in peace with himself. And I think this is very important to understand also his music. He struggled, of course, like everyone struggles in his life. And you can hear it in, in his music sometimes, but it always ends in peace and with hope. It's always a bright future at the end. Thank you very much. Yes, inside the palace console and the original instrument. So if any of you are thinking of joining the Yu Jong um, Got Talent competition, um, Stars of Tomorrow, you could think of playing the baritone as a crazy skills because um, I don't reckon there'd be many people learning that instrument at the moment. Very, very interesting. Um, and apparently, uh, because Haydn tended to play the instrument rather better than uh, the Count, he was very, very annoyed and tried to discourage Haydn from playing it himself when he was present. What we've been looking at up to now is the Esterhazy Palace at Eisenstadt. Now, Eisenstadt is very, very close to Vienna. So when Haydn and the musicians were working, they could pop out very, very easily, go, you know, do whatever they wanted to do in Vienna. Unfortunately, in, in the mid, for them, in the, in the mid uh, 1760s, Prince Nicholas decided to move his court to the Esterhazy Palace, a much bigger palace in Hungary. Now, this palace, which you can see before you on, on the pictures, um, 
was really a long, long way from anywhere. And it's known that Haydn got very, very lonely there, as did his musicians. In fact, Haydn wrote a symphony in this palace called the Farewell Symphony, because the prince kept stopping the students, uh, the, not the students, you're the students, stop, stop, stop Haydn and the musicians from leaving to go and sort of join their families and have fun or whatever it was in Vienna. So he wrote this symphony to try and um, remind the prince to let them go and have a holiday. So what happens in the symphony in the last movement, one by one, the musicians leave the stage and the music keeps playing. And right at the end, you're left with two violins, of which in the original performance, the concert master was playing first violin, Haydn was playing second, and the very last person to leave the room blows out the candle and the stage is empty. Um, a sort of COVID uh, restrictions type thing as we all leave one by one from school, maybe, you never know. So but this is where um, Haydn en ended up in, at the Esterhazy Palace. Um, in 1784, and let's move on to the next slide, Haydn met this young man, Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, I think Mozart was about 28 years old when he met him. Um, they became great friends and great admirers of each other's music. Uh, Mozart was known to not really particularly like anybody's music that much at that time, because he was such an extraordinary genius. But he had a special affection for Haydn, and he wrote six string quartets, which he dedicated to Haydn's. No commission, nothing, just straight from his heart. He wrote six string quartets, which we now know as the Haydn Quartets. So let's move on to the next slide. And there's a picture of the great Haydn himself, which we saw at the beginning. So there's a picture. Let, let, let's move on to the next one. So Haydn and Mozart are known to have played string quartets together. And you can see in this picture on the right hand side, a very animated Mozart with a viola. And Haydn is on the left hand side playing the violin. Um, not sure who the second violin is in that quartet, but uh, so I particularly like that picture, just watching them all sort of in action together, pretty much as we are today. But note the clothes that they wore. I mean, they, at the court, you had to wear a powdered wig. Um, the only time I think today that anyone wears a powdered wig is um, in the courtroom. So that has, in some ways has stayed, but also the, the, the sort of riches they wore, the shoes, the jackets, very, very different from today. Um, I'm sure they would find it equally funny seeing us all wearing masks today if they all came back. So let's move on to the next picture. So this gentleman, Johann Peter Salomon. Now, the symphony that we're playing at the moment at school, the, the London Symphony, which we will hear at the end of this, um, the arrangement we are playing is made by this man. And what he did was he, he took a lot of instruments out, added a piano part, and made a more chamber-like version of it so that smaller forces could play these great pieces of Haydn. In fact, he arranged several of the symphonies. Um, this man was a, an impresario. He was, a, a, he was born in Bonn, he came from Germany, but he moved to London where he put on concert series and raised money. He was a very, very clever businessman. And in 1790, Count, Count, uh, Prince Nicholas died and was replaced by his son Anton Esterhazy, who was not so keen on music. So what happened was that the orchestra was cut down, the, the duties were cut down, Haydn was put on a retainer, and his work greatly reduced. But he wasn't too bothered because he moved back to Vienna, where, where he sort of went back to all his mates again and his friends, and he was able to sort of do his own things and write music for commissions and do many things. And Mr. Salomon went in 1790 to Vienna to invite Haydn and Mozart to go to London. Now Haydn was reluctant to go uh, because of his work at the, at the court, but he was persuaded by Salomon. Mozart in December 1790 
said he was very keen to go, but due to some commissions and work he was doing, he said he would come in a year's time. Now, history tells us, sadly, that Mozart died in December 1791. So Mozart sadly never went there. Uh, he, he, you know, he went. And so Haydn left, and it said that Salomon and, and Mozart both waved him off on his coach. And he took the long journey to London from Vienna. Well, you know, you can't, these days, if you get on a plane, it take an hour and a half. In those days, it took many, many days. And after a few days, he turned up in Bonn, where it said he met Beethoven for the first time, a very young Beethoven. Um, and when he came back five years later from London, uh, Beethoven actually became his student. So it's interesting how these composers interconnect with each other. And so he made all his way in coach and horse, staying at inns, traveling along the way until he got to Calais um, and the, the boat from Calais to Dover, which takes about an hour on a ferry these days. He got on that at seven in the morning and got off at half past five that day. So it just shows you how much time you needed in those days to travel. So he went to London and he wrote lots of symphonies. He did lots of concerts. And the symphony that we've been playing, uh, which we will hear soon, is called the London Symphony. Um, and so when, when he finally went back to Vienna, he, he was very, very famous and, and a much more wealthy man than he'd been. So let's move on to the next slide. And we will see here a little bit of score of Haydn, um, beautiful handwriting, the Kaiserlied, the song of the emperor. And now this melody, a lot of you will know this melody as the national anthem of Germany and Austria. Um, but actually when it was written, it was not written really in the bombastic way one hears it played as a, as a national anthem. It was written as the most beautiful piece of music. And we're now going to hear how it was, how originally sounded coming from one of Haydn's wonderful string quartets of which he wrote 83. So let's move on to the next video. beauty from Haydn so you know we heard earlier on his surprise symphony the symph symphony he wrote to surprise the audiences to stop them going to sleep and now we just hear this melody of complete and total beauty um, and if you listen to many of Haydn's quartets you will hear similar beautiful things so we now move on to hear some of the authentic instruments now um, what, what, what you will see before you, before we play this video, is the violins, violas, cello, bass, oboes of the authentic style. Um, the leader of this orchestra is a, man, a friend of ours called Pavlo Beznasuk, who, who's been to Hong Kong one or two times. And I, I believe that some of you actually played for him when he held some master classes. So it might be interesting after we've you know, in this little bit of video, you'll hear Pablo talk a little bit about 
Haydn and what it means to him, which is pretty much what I would expect to hear from most musicians. So let's let's have a listen to this wonderful symphony on authentic instruments. Just incredibly hyperactive. <laughs> such a joy to play Haydn. I mean, you actually feel healthier for playing Haydn somehow at the end of a rehearsal even. You know, it has some most miraculous uh, healing qualities. genius like uh, Haydn comes along and he has a patron who is actually proud of, of uh, his patronage of, of uh, Haydn, um, then the, the focus becomes more on the wonderful group of musicians and the wonderful things that they're uh, doing. So we have to be grateful to, uh, to Papa Haydn for that. <laughs> After the beauty of the string quartet, the storm and drive of that extraordinary symphony number 49 by Haydn. And I must say, when I stand in front of you guys, those of you that have been playing the Haydn with me, I feel about what we do, very much what Pablo was describing then, that it gives us a sort of joy. And I can see that in your faces when, when you're playing Haydn as well. Um, so maybe that symphony written in the mid 1790s might also reflect what was going on in Europe at that time because it was going into a very 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 dark and turbulent time. Um, we've got if we move on to the next slide there is Napoleon and so it, behind that symphony may well have been the start of these Napole these uh, re French revolutionary wars and the picture you see of, of Napoleon there was a young general uh, long before he became emperor, leading the troops in the French Revolutionary Wars of 1797. Then, of course, in 1805, we get the Napoleonic Wars, which were to last until 1815. And Haydn and indeed Beethoven were both in Vienna when the Emperor Napoleon invaded that city um, after defeating the Austrian forces at the Battle of Austerlitz. So there's another little taster of what was going on in the background behind Haydn, just to open up your imaginations of what, what life might have been like. So finally, we come to the very piece that we've been playing in orchestra, the great London Symphony, 104. Haydn wrote 104 symphonies. He wrote operas, he wrote oratorios, the most famous for the creation. He wrote wonderful religious music, songs, you name it, piano sonatas, uh, such a huge volume of music. And um, this is obviously the last symphony he wrote. Um, what you will see here is a, a performance from a, a London promenade concert. So you've got all the ingredients here. You've got a concert in London, Haydn was in London. You've got a, a great conductor in Berlin Heiting, but you've got the Vienna Philharmonic in modern times, just you know, a few years ago, 2012 playing this wonderful symphony um, and for those of you playing it have a good listen to this because this is this is what you've been studying and learning and we will definitely be playing this piece when this covid uh, 
experience has finished. So let's have a listen to the Haydn Symphony.
have the Haydn London Symphony, the final movement, total joy, where you can hear Haydn's beautiful humor and personality and character. So we've managed to show you lots of different types of music um, that Haydn wrote in, the, in this, with these little extracts we've given you. Um, it would be great if one day that we can conquer the, uh, the sound of music over Zoom. It's still not as good as it could be. So we will make available the videos for people who want to watch them. Um, anybody who wants to watch them in, in slightly better quality. So Haydn was to live until 1809. He lived to be 77 years old, which was very old for that time. I mean, Mozart barely made 36, um, which was fairly standard actually in those days. So just to finish. Um, uh, maybe Sen and uh, you can stop it. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So it's nice Does to see it, everybody's face. Nice to see everybody. And uh, we, we're still in Eisenstadt, as you can see, um, on, our, on the square outside the palace. Well, I've, I've got a question to you, because I, I know a lot of you before COVID have done a lot of traveling. Put your thumb up uh, if you've been to Austria or Vienna or anywhere in that region, Prague. If you went to Prague or Salzburg or Graz or many of these places, particularly places that avoided being bombed during the Second World War, you would see architecture very, very like that. And in fact, when they made the movie back in the 1980s of Amadeus, rather than have film sets, they actually filmed it in Prague. So they could have all those wonderful buildings like you saw in that today. So um, next week, we will um, probably do a, a rehearsal for those of you in orchestra um, with some, for some sectional thing. And then I will work on doing another one of these talks, probably in a couple of weeks time on another composer so that we can sort of visit different types of music, hear different types of music and different composers' experiences. And I'd just like to add that if you have any um, suggestions, any of you, you know, uh, whatever area of music that you wish to sort of explore, um, you know, like even rock music or pop music, anything, um, please let us know. And, um, you know, we want to make it as diverse and as interesting as possible for all of you. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Great. And, um, and thank you for so many of you for coming. Thank you. Bye thank bye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye